In the beginning, a program called Life Simulation World was developed by humans in the early years of computing, before the Internet even existed. Its developers gave the program survival instincts so that it would act like a living being. But as the Internet started to be developed, that program drifted across computers, collecting data and evolving into a sentient living being. The researchers gave this program a name, Digital Monster or Digimon. Later they developed new programs that would analyze this new digital lifeform like Digimon Capture and Digimon Loader. But in addition to researchers, Digimon were discovered by hackers who wanted to use them for other purposes. The Digimon Capture program discovered that Digimon are not living isolated on the Internet. Researchers discovered clusters of data that proved the existence of another world. This world had layers of depth like a sea, so they named it NetSea and later collectively the digital world. After discovering the digital world, the researchers' focus shifted to making contact with that world. Researchers then created the File Island, a virtual space within the digital world for studying Digimon and an operating system called Yggdrasil OS, the first one to be used to see inside the digital world. But Digimon soon took over File Island, developing it much further than humans expected. Later, Folder Continent was discovered. Yggdrasil developed a will of its own and cut off the digital world from the network in order to protect it from the overflow of information from the human world. What followed is a period known as the ancient digital world with the dominion of the four holy beasts. A great catastrophe happened in the ancient digital world which caused the reversal of the north-south axis and resulted in the extinction of many ancient Digimon alongside the loss of Digimentals. When Yggdrasil closed access of humans to the digital world, all the other digital worlds came together in the clustered digital world. This cluster keeps all the digital worlds connected but isolated, much like cloud technology. The worlds that form this cluster include the digital world managed by Yggdrasil, a new digital world separate from it, the Iliad managed by Homeros, as well as a possibility of more worlds not yet discovered. One of these digital worlds, Iliad, is the setting of the new Digimon story game that will feature the Olympus 12, this world's equivalent of the Royal Knights as central characters. To learn more about them, you can check out my video about the group. After a long time, Digimon story game is going back to the digital world. At this point, the next story game has been in development for almost 9 years. In this video, we explore what caused this long development period and everything we know about the game so far. Digimon Story is a series of role-playing Digimon games, which started in 2006 with Digimon Story and includes Sunburst and Moonlight, Lost Evolution, Supercross Wars Red and Blue and most recently Cyber Sleuth and Hacker's Memory, released in 2015 and 2017 respectively. The next game in the Story series was first mentioned by its producer Kazumasa Habu in an interview in April 2016, when he said that the company is planning to do another Story game, but this time for PlayStation 4. The previous story games have all been made for handheld devices like Nintendo DS, PlayStation Vita or Portable and some were later ported to PlayStation 4. But this time the game would be built from scratch for PlayStation, which would require 3-4 to four years of development. Kazumasa Habu is a game developer from Namco who started working on Digimon after Bandai and Namco merged to become Bandai Namco Games. It's safe to say he revolutionized Digimon games and brought them to a much wider audience outside Japan. Despite not entering the world of Digimon games as a Digimon fan, he soon became a hardcore fan and even started referring to himself as Habumon. When Habu came to Digimon in 2010, the franchise was still chasing children as their target audience. The plan for the company for Digimon at that time was to have children watch the anime, become interested in Digimon and then buy related products. But the majority of Digimon fans were now in high school or college. The franchise wanted to rejuvenate its audience with Cross Wars, which not only didn't bring in any new kids, but angered the existing fans by changing the lore. Habu realized this and wanted to focus his game production efforts on the existing fans, make the games easy to play for everyone and spread the market overseas. This is something that often caused him friction with his superiors, who still saw Digimon as a product for kids and wanted to focus on the domestic audience. This clash of ideas Tight budgets and the resulting compromises started becoming evident with the development of Digimon Redigitize. Habu was adamant that the game should be targeted for adults and developed for PSP, while his higher-ups wanted the game on 3DS. In an interview, Habu explained the idea behind the game's title was to signify the revival of the Digimon World series, with Re referring to a reply or return and Digitize to turning something digital, basically symbolizing the return of the franchise. 
But with low success of the Cross Wars anime and accompanying games, the budget for redigitize was tight. Still, the game turned out to be a success. But the stakeholders still didn't want to let go of children, and some compromises had to be made. The following year, Redigitize was ported to 3DS as Redigitize Decode and made available only in Japan. People inside the company and stakeholders still had a strong perception that Digimon was for children and they didn't understand that their audience has grown older. So Habu made a plea with the stakeholders. If we, the developers, make Digimon games stubbornly saying Digimon is a title for children, the game won't really reach the fans who are supporting Digimon now. As a result of successful products targeting an older age group, the idea that Digimon can be for adults too spread within the company. It was because of this process that Cyber Sleuth was able to completely change course and target adults. Released in 2015 for PS Vita, Cyber Sleuth was a major success, but the game almost didn't make it outside Japan. It was a petition from the fans from the West and Habu's persistence that the game was released internationally one year later and it ended up selling three times better than in Japan. So the company started making plans for the next story game. The goal for the sequel was to fully target overseas fans as well as domestic ones. However, the console landscape had changed in the meantime with PlayStation 4 becoming the mainstream hardware. This meant the developers had to rebuild the game engine for PS4 which had a higher standard than handheld devices and make new graphics. That would take 3 to 4 years to create a game from scratch. It would mean a long gap in Cyber Sleuth. As Habu said, faster delivery of games requires sharing of resources like 3D models. But if they use the same models too much, it would start to feel like selling the same product more than once. Since fans pay money to buy the game every time, the challenge for the future was to remake the graphics as much as the budget allows. Especially with the development based on PS4 standards, Habu considered they can't keep using the old models. It's important to note that since this time, PlayStation 5 has been released, which requires all new PS4 games to also be compatible with PS5. Originally, after Cyber Sleuth, Habu was supposed to step down as the Digimon games producer, but the success of Cyber Sleuth made him want to do much bigger projects. Habu believed that not letting the fans' enthusiasm cool down is very important in continuing the Digimon IP, and in order to do that, it's important to provide content regularly. So, while the company was making a new Digimon story game, they wanted to give fans something to play while they wait, which resulted in the release of Hacker's Memory in 2017, a new site of Cyber Sleuth. This time, the international version of the game was released one month after the Japanese, proving the effort to focus on the international markets as well. Releasing Hacker's Memory and porting the current games to other platforms became a means to increase the number of Digimon story players before the release of the new game. Habu's plan for the story series was to fulfill the fans' dreams of having every Digimon from the encyclopedia in a game and to give each Digimon an evolution line with different routes. He wanted to try something different regarding the evolution process. Instead of requirements like leveling up or the strength of bonds with children, he had an idea for Digimon to evolve depending on the actions of players and the choices they make on how they treat their friends and Digimon. This is how Digimon Survive came to be. Originally planned to be released in 2019 as another bridge between Cyber Sleuth and the next story game, Survive ended up getting delayed until 2022. Habu thought that the quality of the product the development company Witchcraft made wasn't good enough and needed improvement. So it was decided to hire another company to finish the game. But since Witchcraft used their own proprietary engine, the new company Hyde had to rebuild the game from scratch. To cut costs, Habu had to work with a small development team. Because of this, the game planned to be released in 2019 was released in 2022. For many months, there was no news about its development, so many fans thought the game had been cancelled. Doesn't this sound familiar? During all these years of development of the next Digimon Story game, Habu continued giving interviews and posting on his Twitter account about the progress. He wanted the game to have both the human world and the digital worlds as the main setting. He also wanted to make the game consistent to the lore, so he had to do a lot of research. Digimon is 27 years old this year and during these 27 years a lot of content was released that is difficult to keep track of. And Habu is a perfectionist. As he himself once said, I have the I'll die if I don't make things disease, so I want to be as particular as possible about the things I'm involved in, even if it takes a lot of effort. But on the 20th of February this year, Habu tweeted the following. Due to personnel changes within the company, I will no longer be in charge of producing the Digimon games. In fact, I was no longer in charge in April of last year and have been quietly handing over my responsibilities. 
please rest assured that the team is continuing development of the new Digimon story under the direction of a director I trust. Being involved with the Digimon content and experiencing the passion of the fans is the greatest asset I have had. I would like to express my gratitude to the fans who loved the work. Thank you very much. Please continue to support Digimon. This is the last tweet from his account. In March this year, Bandai revealed they have recently cancelled five games that were in development because of strict quality rules. Luckily, the new Digimon Story game was not among the five. During the Digimon Con 2024, the creators apologized for the delays and asked for patience, as more information will be revealed in due time. Bandai also released a survey for fans this year about what we want from Digimon games, so something is definitely still brewing in that department. But with almost a decade in development, we still even don't have a screenshot or a sketch from the game. It's important to note that the landscape has greatly changed for Digimon since Habu left. From its renaissance in 2015, started by Digimon Try, we've had three anime series, two movies and several games. But since Habu left in April last year, Digimon seems to have shifted its focus back on the Japanese market, with fewer international releases or even content. Digimon currently has one active mobile game, which is exclusive to the Chinese market, and another announced called Source Code that doesn't leave much room for hope of reaching the West. So Digimon went from not wanting fans to wait too long between game releases, to leaving international fans with nothing to play but old titles. I talked about this in my Source Code video, if you want to learn more about it. All of this feels like proof that Habu was the one who pushed the franchise to deliver products regularly and not leave out international fans. A question now arises, is the lack of news about the new story game a lesson from past mistakes, to not announce products too early and not deliver them on time, or will the game eventually be released but only in Japan? What do you think about the state of Digimon games right now, and when will we hear more news about the new story game? Tell me in the comments below. If you want to support me, you can do so on Patreon or the Buy Me Coffee website, the links are in the description below. Thank you for watching, stay tuned for more Digimon videos. P.S. Make sure to follow my community page on YouTube, as I also post updates about upcoming videos there.